Welcome everybody to our uh, panel here at the Global at the Milken Institute 2016 Global Conference, filling the mid-market financing gap. My name is Stacey Warden, and I run the Center for Financial Markets at the Milken Institute. And let me just start by introducing our panelists. Uh, Mike Arrighetti is the co-founder and president of uh, Aries uh, Management. Uh, then um, uh, Andre Bourbonnet, next to me, is the president and CEO of PSP Investments, which is Canada's fourth largest investment fund. Uh, to my immediate left is Bilal Rashid, who's the chairman and CEO of OFS Capital Management. Uh, next to him is Brian Reynolds, who is the CEO of uh, Chatham Capital. And then on the end, uh, because we need to have the banks represented on this <laughs> mid-market uh, panel, is Steve Sugarman, who's the chairman, president, and CEO of Bank of California. So very excited to have these guys on, uh, on the panel with me today. And let me just start, though, by setting the stage a little bit, because the mid-market is very important to the global to, to the Milken Institute. And we think about financing and access to capital right from SMEs all the way up the, uh, up the value chain. And we've had a couple of uh, panels in the past about that address this issue of, uh, if, is there a gap and how do you fill it in mid-market finance? And so we really want to uh, dig into that today. But if I can just pull up a couple of slides. So slide number one, just to think about the importance of this sec sector of the economy. This is an economy, as soon as we get that slide up, uh, has, that has generated 51 million uh, jobs and is 30% of all jobs in the economy. Um, and so we're not talking about small numbers here, right? I mean, this is um, the same amount of jobs that are created by the large cap uh, firms. And if you go to slide two, you can also see that the employment growth since the crisis has been uh, almost 5%, 4.5%, uh, compared to 2% for the large cap firms and uh, negative growth for the SMEs. And then just one, quick, one more quick number, if you go to slide five, 92% of the nearly 2.3 million jobs created since 2008 have been in the uh, mid-market. So this is a, uh, the, the, the portfolio companies that these guys invest in are very important economically for this country and I really want to, to dig into to, to the, to ways that we can help them and, and to this sector. So um, I want to just give you guys an opportunity, though, to quickly talk about your firm so that the audience has a, a chance to understand where you come from. So just say something about your firm, the financing vehicles that you use, and how you think about the mid-market, kind of just quickly to start. So Mike, why don't we Sure. So good afternoon. Mike Arrighetti. I'm the president of Aries Management and the chairman of Aries Capital Corporation, which is the largest BDC in the market. Aries is a global alternative asset manager that currently manages approximately $95 billion of assets. And about two thirds of that $95 billion or in excess of $60 billion is in our global credit business. <clears throat> and within that global credit business, roughly $35 billion of those assets are what we refer to as self-originated private credit, where we're extending loans to small and medium-sized companies both in the US and, uh, and Europe. So Aldo um I run PSP Investment, which is the pension plan manager for all of the uh, federal civil servants in, in Canada, the Royal uh, Canadian Mounted Police, uh, the guy with the nice uniforms in the, and the uh, army. Uh, so we're $115 billion uh, pension plan manager, uh, and um, we are a fully funded uh, pension plan and uh, with defined, defined uh, uh, benefit. Um, we are, as most of our peers, in uh, pretty much all of the asset class, public, private equity, infrastructure, real estate, natural resources. Uh, and uh, when I joined uh, uh, PSP, one asset class that was notably missing was was the private debt, uh, the private debt group. We had with corporate and and credit and, and fixed income, but but no um, no uh, defined uh, private debt group. So that's one of the initiative that I took when I uh, I first joined about a year ago. Um, and uh, we uh, have a, a allocation in terms of policy portfolio, so each has a class is defined. Uh, and uh, our target, and although we're in rampa, but our target in the private debt uh, class is is five percent of our total assets. So as you can see, um, a fairly big command. 
Um, we, uh, we don't exclusively invest in the, uh, the min market. Uh, we, we do large cap and, and large transaction. Uh, but we need scale. So we, we would define mid market as sort of middle to upper mid market. So companies with 25 to 100 million okay. of, of EDA. OK, terrific. Uh, Bilal. Yes, uh, I'm uh, uh, Bilal Rashid. I'm uh, president of uh, OFS Capital Management. Uh, OFS is a corporate uh, credit focused uh, investment platform. We have about uh, 1.9 billion uh, of assets uh, under management. Uh, we uh, currently manage a BDC, a public BDC called OFS Capital Corporation. Um, that is uh, focused on uh, what I would define as the uh, lower middle market. And so the way we define lower middle market is uh, companies uh, with revenues of uh, 15 to 100 million, EBITDA of about 3 uh, to uh, 15 uh, million. And uh, uh, all of our debt financing comes uh, uh, from the SBIC program, uh, which is the Small Business Investment Company program of the SBA, uh, the Small Business Administration. Uh, we'll I think talk we'll about talk about it yeah, in we'll a minute that. Mm -hmm. on that. Uh, we also manage uh, several uh, private uh, funds uh, that focus on uh, the larger uh, syndicated market as well. Okay, Brian. Thank you, Stacy. Good morning. I'm Brian Reynolds. I'm CEO for Chatham Capital. We have a billion dollars under management, and uh, we play in the uh, lower middle market, which I define as, uh, and we define as, less than a hundred million dollar enterprise value and uh, we do five to fifty million dollar investments in each of those transactions and um, mostly uh, eighty percent unit tranche uh, senior and twenty percent second lien. Hi, Stephen Sugarman. I'm the CEO of Bank of California. We're a publicly traded bank holding company uh, with about ten billion dollars of assets. Uh, we participate um, on the senior side within middle market financing, and we tend to focus on opportunities where we can partner either with the companies or with the sponsors of, of the transactions. Okay, terrific. So what I want to talk about is the regulatory and other environment for this space, the opportunities in this space, the trends that we're seeing, and uh, what we expect to see in the future. So Brian, let me start with you. How, how have you seen the sector evolve since, the, since 2008, say? What, what's, what's been happening and what, should, what have you been paying attention to? So uh, we'll go to slide 13 and um, wait for that to come up. And um, so after the Great Recession, we had a secular change in the business where uh, we lost a bunch of finance companies in the market, um, GMAC and, uh, and others. And, um, and then the hedge funds had gotten into the credit markets and they're out of it um, and left. You know, this is not a place for um, someone that uh, is short term and short term thinking. And then the BDCs at the time had, uh, you know, had gotten out of the market also. They rebounded later in uh, 13 and 14 and raised a bunch of capital. And if you go to size 20, slide 26. You're going to be quizzed on this slide, though, at the end of it. <laughs> and if you go to, go to slide 26, you can see that the, the second thing that happened is Dodd-Frank regulations came in. And you can see that the banks had 70% of all of the leveraged loan volume and, uh, in 1994. And today, it's down to 12.5%, 12.2%. And so the banks are really out of the game. And their uh, level three assets went from 681 million billion to 227 billion. So the banks are out of the market. The finance companies that you see up here are, are filling that gap. And uh, we don't, I don't like the word shadow banking market, but they, they sometimes refer to us as the shadow banking market. Mike, is this a fad? Is this a real shift? Do you agree? How do you think about it? Yeah, I don't think it's a fad at all. I, we've been in the lending business, and we talk about lending. We're not just saying middle market leverage lending because this is a global trend. I think it's a permanent trend, and it's all about private credit. So one other slide I think that we could look at in this context is the prior slide, 25. Um, the banks, you've got Dodd-Frank, Volcker. You have the implementation of Basel III. You have the OCC leverage lending guidelines creeping into the market. 
So generally the regulatory framework, and Steve can chime in here, is the regulators are asking, I think, on the heels of the financial crisis for banks to de-risk, deleverage, and simplify their business models. And that's not just showing up in the leveraged loan market as we've used to think about it. It's in private credit generally. And you can see on this slide that if you look at the percentage of, of CNI loans on bank balance sheets, it was about 26% in 1990 and it's now down below 15%. And that's been a pretty uh, meaningful trend. You can also see the number of regulated banks in this country is shrinking as well. So when I think about is it, a, is it a fad, I think this is not a fad. I think this is a real issue, to your point, that's facing the middle market economy here. Everybody likes to talk about the credit crisis as what happens when there's too much credit in the market. I think we also have to say there's a form of credit crisis, which is when companies looking for capital can't access uh, the capital that they need. And so what's happening uh, outside of the banking system, largely as a result of regulation, but also because of investor appetite for this type of, of investment is we're seeing capital coming from all sorts of places to fill the void. I think once that void is filled, it's gonna be very hard to see the tide go back out and, and uh, push back into the banking system. Steve, do you agree? Are these guys eating your lunch? Are you looking at early <laughs> retirement over there or, or what? Well, I, 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 I completely agree with Mike. Uh, I think when it comes to the systematically important banks, those banks over $50 billion, that the game's pretty much over for levered lending. Uh, with the regulatory construct and how things are being implemented, uh, the fact is that without a material repricing of that lending segment, uh, the math just doesn't work for banks. So uh, for the larger banks, I think you'll see it continue. Uh, I think that it creates a meaningful opportunity. Uh, the place where banks, the larger banks are playing now are mostly with house accounts or accounts where they have sponsors or other fee generating opportunities around IPOs or middle market companies that are anticipated to come public. And the levered lending market has become the equivalent of a loss leader for the large banks. Mm. The, 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 the main thing to look at is that when you look at opportunities out there, um, the levered lending market for a bank just mathematically is much less compelling to equivalent securities. And so once you start seeing a direct loan get more expensive than an equivalent security, it tends to say that banks would be using it as a loss leader and not really an economic driver. The, the main shift though is distinguishing and what we see is kind of a change that maps their game. It's not just a shadow banking uh, environment. It's a shadow large banking environment where regional players and players who are not subject to the um, Dodd-Frank and large bank uh, regulations uh, have the same benefits as the shadow banking. So a regional player like Bank of California is able to get the same economics but do so on a bank balance sheet which has a nice capital advantage. So we look at it as a very similar opportunity as, as the investors here where we're helping to fill that void. I think over the last five years, we filled about $20 billion of the shortfall within Southern California of about $32 billion of lending that left the market with the Great Recession. Um, but how we choose to do it is through partnership, where if you have the right expertise and the right balance sheet, we tend to be on the senior side of the structure. So while local companies come to us and, we, and we're happy to bank them directly, uh, a big part of our uh, partnerships are with companies like these that really want the uh, mez tranche economics or want economics that are above bank targets and look to banks to take some of the balance sheet and really develop a partnership uh, that allows them to feed their business and us to generate the more modest returns that we're looking for. All right. Like my mother always told me, if you can't lick them, join them. <laughs> uh, Andre, you are, are uh, changing the investment uh, uh, philosophy uh, at your company mm -hmm. for the first time. And so can you talk a little bit about that? You're the first person to go into direct lending. And how do you think about that as a direct yeah. investor? Yeah. So, so the question of why we did it, and, and I sort of tend to paraphrase in Manelary, is because it's there. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> uh, and the question is, to me, was more why, why not being that asset class? So. In my previous life, I'd run the playbook uh, fairly successfully. Private debt was 
arguably one of the most successful asset class in the private investment group and in my, my former shop at, at CPP and probably across all the asset classes. So to me, it was a natural to bring in uh, that expertise. I, I knew what to do, and, and more importantly, I learned the hard way not what not to do. Um, so, and then <clears throat> there's a confluence of, of obviously a factor, and we've talked about the, the withdrawal of, of the banks, but that is also combined with uh, a fairly significant increase in, in demand. If you look at the fundraising cycle among the private equity funds right now after a difficult post-08 cycle and vintage, uh, right now it looks like everybody can raise the funds that they want. So, uh, you know, arguably it's going to be uh, demand for, for a leverage loan uh, at, at all size of, of companies. Uh, and also the, the vintage, the previous vintage will need either refinancing uh, and um, so I think that the demand side is, is going to be there. And a lot of corporates will also because, you know, cash is still a very important part of their balance sheet and looking at, you know, increasing uh, their activities on, on the corporate development side. So I think the M&A will continue to to generate a lot of, of opportunities for, for that asset class. So, so that was one of the, the, the main reason. I, I think also that, uh, you, you know, given who we are, it's an important asset class and it's the fastest growing asset class among private investments. So we needed to take a, to, uh, take a hard look. And we're in a fairly good position because I think lenders like to have somebody like us because we're not, <coughs> we're not there to turn the portfolio, they, they know uh, who the, the, the lender is, they, they understand what our, uh, our goals and objectives are. Uh, so we're sort of a safe pair of hands in, in uh, transaction, both in the mid-market and large cap. Can I chime in here for one second? Because you made an interesting point about this being the fastest growing and maybe best performing private asset class. And we've heard that from a lot of our global institutional investor clients. Um, and it's all well and good to say that there's demand for credit coming from middle market borrowers and that there's appetite and capability uh, resident in, in firms like, like ours, but the capital needs to flow. And I think one important piece of this is the asset class has now actually established itself as something that people are thinking about in terms of their global asset allocation. So partially driven by interest rates, partially driven by volatility in global equity markets, the amount of capital is now actively allocating into private debt because of its characteristics is actually a big part of what's allowing the market to institutionalize outside of the, yeah. the banking sector. Which is the risk because, you know, if you look at the spectrum of private assets right now, on a risk-adjusted basis, I would argue that private debt is probably the one that is more interesting as the other asset class are pretty fraudy and at the top of the market valuation. Uh, the risk is that now everybody sees that that's you know that's the asset class and there's a, a supply of an increased supply of capital. And let me let me jump in here on that. I think if you turn to slide 16, you can see the uh, the overhang in the uh, uh, in the market in the PE market. There's uh, half a billion half a trillion dollars of uh, capital waiting to be deployed. And that that's usually leveraged one to one. Now it's about 43 percent. Uh, but, and you note on there that 2013, most of it is 2013 forward class, and um, that's because the PE firm sold over $100 billion worth of assets um, when we had an increase, after the, after the Great Recession, the multiples increased, so they um, had the best time in history to sell. And so you have that demand, and if you look at slide 15, you can see that, um, you can see that there's a total of $1 trillion of, of uh, either both the uh, capital that's becoming due and the private equity capital. So the combination of those two of refinances that are out there and private equity is over a trillion dollars. So this is a huge demand. This is a, um, a solid market and developed market, as Michael said, and uh, people are allocating to it. Okay, let's drill into that a little bit more. Let's drill into this market opportunity point and ask again, and I'll just I'll go down the line uh, on this, starting with Bilal. You know, what is the opportunity in this space? You know, why does the opportunity exist? Who is the opportunity going to benefit? Bilal, why don't we start with you? Sure. Uh, you know, I think um, the opportunity uh, certainly exists for, uh, uh, you know, alternative uh, credit providers like us. Um, I can talk about uh, 
the opportunity set that we are seeing and where we are seeing the yeah. highest uh, risk adjusted returns. And uh, you know, for us, we're seeing that uh, the lower middle market, uh, and especially uh, what we call the non-sponsored part of the lower middle market, so companies uh, that are owned by uh, families, that are owned by management, as opposed to private equity firms. Um, so we're seeing, uh, for us, the uh, best risk adjusted returns uh, in uh, that uh, segment of the market, lower middle market, as I was defining earlier, three to 15 million EBITDA, 15 to 100 million of revenue, and non-sponsored companies, because there's uh, even less competition in that part of the market uh, as a, uh, you know, if, you, if we were to compare it with even the broader uh, middle market. Um, and I think one example of that, what we're seeing is that, uh, at least uh, the deals that we're looking at, that uh, you know, at si uh, you know, similar leverage levels, uh, similar what I would call credit profiles, you're able to get uh, a, a, a higher uh, return uh, compared to some of the larger uh, middle market uh, and sponsored middle market uh, uh, companies. And I think uh, the main reason, uh, in my opinion, for that is uh, uh, that uh, these deals are harder to source. Uh, you uh, definitely need boots on the ground uh, need the relationship and uh, relationships and expertise uh, to evaluate these transactions, but more importantly, source these transactions. So that's sort of our, that's been our main focus, uh, and that's where we're finding the best opportunity. Okay, Brian? So um, I, would, I would go to slide 12 and, and look at, uh, one, of the, one of the things that's also happened here is, is the BDCs came back in um, 13, 14 and raised 35 billion and flooded the middle market with capital, um, giving it some structure, reducing the risk a little bit, reducing the returns quite a bit on a risk-adjusted basis. And then, but recently, the uh, BDCs have traded below 100 NAV, and um, it's difficult for them to raise money in the public markets when they get below 100 NAV. So they can't, they can't raise money, so there's a, an additional opportunity because they can recycle that money now and it's in the, it's in the system, but it's not a pile of new money coming in every, uh, every quarter. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great opportunity for those that are in the market today to get improved pricing and structures. Okay. Hmm. All right, Mike, why don't I turn to you on that? We'll talk about that, uh, the NAV, later, but why, how do you think about that? I sometimes feel that we drill down too much and we lose the, the bigger picture. Um, and when we talk about what's attractive about the asset class, it's about self-origination and, and alpha generation. But if you go back to 30,000 feet and you say, what's going on in the world today? We are struggling for global growth. We have perpetually low interest rates. We have volatile equity markets, and every investor that we talk to, and we talk to many, if you're a pension fund and you have an actuarial payout requirement of 7 to 8%, and you're making 3% in your fixed income basket, what do you do? If you're an insurance company, you're dealing with solvency two, and you're dealing with lower rates of return in your liquid fixed income basket, what do you do? If you're a retiree and you're looking for yield, and all of a sudden you don't know how to get it, what do you do? So I think it's great to talk about opportunities in non-sponsored mezzanine and opportunities in you know, European bank loans, but I think you have to just think about the bigger picture. The, the, the industry is an amalgamation of specialists that are in and around different asset classes, but the trend is I think the thing that is, is most important because when you talk about things like risk-adjusted return, that means that each asset that you look at has a piece of risk and a relevant return, and you're going to decide whether that's that's good for you or not. So some people that we invest for want to make an 8% unlevered return on senior loans, and that's a great risk-adjusted return. And some people want to make a 20% return doing rescue lending to energy companies, and that arguably is a great risk-adjusted return. So when I think about the market, I, I try to keep my eye on the, on the global picture and say why why does this opportunity exist? Why is capital flowing to it? And is it sustainable? And I think what Bilal said, the key, the key element of this is in order to access the market, you have to invest heavily in origination and, and asset aggregation. The, the, 
the outperformance starts and ends with whether or not you're in those local markets seeing the flow. But I'm pretty agnostic as to whether I'm investing in a senior loan at 5% or a mezzanine loan at 15%. I think they're all very attractive. But what's happening globally in terms of just yield and, and risk appetite is really what I think is, is the bigger bigger point here. Okay, but Mike, you're president of Aries Capital Management. People in the audience want to know where you see specific opportunities. Well, I... <laughs> you know, you've got to sing for your supper here on this panel. Um, I promise you I won't sing. My, my, uh, I will spare you that. I, we see it literally all over the private debt spectrum, um, and that's why I, I uh, responded the way I did the last go-around. Um, just to put it in perspective, across the Aries private lending platform, we're looking at two to 3,000 deals per year. And if we're doing our jobs well, maybe we're investing in 5% of those. So build a big global network, sourcing private credit product, and then invest in the best ones that we see. So senior loans in middle market companies in the US, great opportunity. Uh, transitional commercial real estate lending in the US, great opportunity. European private credit, given what's going on in the European banking system, great, great opportunity. There's very little actually in the private credit markets right now that I would say is, is unattractive. Uh, market continues to be inefficient. I'm not as concerned, although we keep an eye on it. Um, what Andre said about capital flows, I think that there's still more deal flow than there is capital, but that's something to keep an eye on. But up and down the, the credit spectrum from senior to sub, sponsored, non-sponsored, US and Europe, we're, we're seeing great risk-adjusted returns. Does anybody want to add to the opportunities <clears throat> discussion before I move on? Yeah. I'd, I'd just add from our perspective, um, the opportunity within banks is pretty clear, that it's the ability to fill, form these partnerships with the middle market companies and sponsors, and to develop the relationships that come with these private uh, loans. So you've got to start with a strong company that's serving the engines of the economy and filling job growth. But once you get that from a bank, there are multiple sources of revenue and, and relationship value. And what's unique about this uh, economy is that most of those banks that are serving it are really doing so in a syndicate structure where they kind of offload the balance sheet and they act as a middleman. So for us, uh, probably similar to some of the partners here, um, it's a generational opportunity to be able to develop the top relationships with the future uh, corporate leaders and financial sponsors in our region, which is California, that just doesn't exist when you have a healthy, uh, larger bank framework where they care about developing relationships with companies. So, so we, we look at it fairly differently than, than other people, and, and quite frankly, we like crisis, and we, we think the last bump in the road didn't last long enough, because that's, I think, where people are willing to pay a premium to our capital that we make the best, the best investment. So, like Michael, we're in the market, and, uh, but we don't have, you know, we have a team, we don't have a team that originate 5,000 transactions a year, so we need a partnership to be able to do that for us. We analyze them, and, and we are in the market constantly, but where I think we see the best Opportunity, you have to believe that the next few years, the, mid, the, the short term and, and medium term, will be sort of a risk on, risk off kind of environment where in that risk off environment when the market, without being distressed, is sort of frozen, uh, our capital is gonna be very valuable. And what we want to be able to play and where we see that we have the best opportunity is to be a, a solution provider. Uh, and be able to um, to make situation that otherwise would not be possible uh, happen. And you know we've we've seen uh, in the larger cap world, the ADT transaction was one of those example. But but also in in Mills Fleet Farm <coughs> a deal done by KKR. I never thought ninety five million dollar would be so important to KKR, but but it was. And we anchored at second lien. And and if we didn't do that. And it's not because it's us. I mean, we happened to be there. We had the network, and, and we, we were very fortunate to have access to that transaction. But if you don't have somebody who's willing to, uh, to take that risk and be paid for it, uh, well, then that's where we see the most, the most opportunities, quite frankly. Yeah. Let me, let me uh, talk a little bit about that, the value proposition that you provide and, and ask what you, what you do bring to the table. And, and, and uh, pulling from your broadly syndicated piece, I mean, I think if 
you know, if you're an investor, I guess there's two point, po points to this question. If you're an investor and you don't want to earn 3%, then you're either going to take liquidity or you're going to take credit risk. And the question, I guess, is are you being compensated for the risk and the cost of investing through through these vehicles? And so if you're in a broadly, if you're a broadly syndicated BDC, for example, uh, you know, are you getting paid uh, adequately for a lack of differentiated uh, selection, or is it that the real value comes and the value proposition for investors comes from a more of a direct landing, buy and hold uh, kind of proposition? Bilal, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yes, certainly. Uh, so I think um, the real value proposition certainly uh, comes from having deep origination capabilities, and you know, as Mike was saying earlier, um, so I think um, that's where you're going to get the uh, the the highest risk adjusted returns. Uh, I think uh, I think if you uh, just uh, buy paper uh, in the market, I think that's something that people, several people can replicate. Uh, you know, several uh, institutional investors certainly can replicate that. So, so I think the value prep proposition really that we are bringing to the table is the expertise uh, in evaluating these middle market companies uh, because I think it does take some additional expertise uh, to really uh, uh, pull your sleeves up and do the work uh, and do the due diligence and underwriting. But I think more importantly, uh, the sourcing relationships, I think, are really very important. I think hard to replicate. Um, and so I think the value proposition really is, is the sourcing and evaluation of uh, uh, these middle market companies. And, and then you get rewarded for that. Uh, you know, you, you're able to get, in my opinion, additional return for a similar risk that you're taking uh, in, in the middle market. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think that uh, that's, uh, that's something that's valuable uh, to in investors. And certainly, that's something that uh, somebody should be paying a fee for. Brian, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so, so um, yeah, I, I agree with those. I think there's three things, you know, sourcing. Um, being able to source the uh, direct deals versus the syndicated transactions, and then underwriting those in a, in a deep way, which uh, we do at Chatham. And then the third part is portfolio management. So when a company goes has a reduction in EBITDA, um, having the ability to go in and take a look at that and be uh, consultative with the companies and improve those cash flows by offering up solutions for advisors, bringing advisors in. You know, I think we have someone here, uh, uh, Herb, that I brought into a deal, did a great job and helped us get out of the, the company. And, um, and also look at verticals that they aren't in and be a strategic advisor to them to improve the EBITDA so that you eventually get out of the loan in a, in a very solid way, working with the private equity groups. Steve, can you offer that same kind of uh, value proposition? Well, we do, but we think about it uh, at times a little bit differently, where all of these transactions that the team's talking about have an element of a bank role in them, whether it's uh, on a warehouse line to help finance the business, the BDs have some leverage to them. Uh, a lot of these companies have senior lenders, and we look at it in two ways. One, if we have a clear expertise in a geographic footprint, we'll directly serve those clients. But number two, especially within our footprint of their financial investors and intermediaries who want to serve those clients, we often see that the best way for a bank to play today and best for us to achieve our returns is just to be uh, some gasoline or the engine that kind of helps helps drive some of these <coughs> private pools of capital. We're seeing it across the board. We're seeing it in uh, specialty lending. We're seeing it in commercial uh, stabilization deals. We're seeing it with peer-to-peer -peer lenders. We're seeing it with middle market lending where there are a lot of great investors and in innovative technologies that are accessing great deal flow um, throughout the state and throughout the country. And it gives us a great opportunity to provide a balance sheet uh, that's a bank balance sheet, a permanent balance sheet, a balance sheet that doesn't compete for the higher end of the return threshold and takes a return that their investors typically don't want, but is a great risk-adjusted return. And so for us, it's often about not just looking at the partnership that can be built with the middle market company, but we get a lot more impact if we were to partner with uh, some of the folks on the stage and provide them a, uh, you know, some senior uh, debt, that capital gets broader support from a credit perspective 
and also has broader impact in terms of the number of companies and the amount of capital that can get out into the middle market. So we see that as the biggest opportunity for a bank that's started small and has been growing really rapidly to be able to take over a segment of the market that the bigger banks have uh, kind of vacated. I think that's a really important point. We, we often joke with some of our friends at banks that, about coopetition. <laughs> and um, when we talk all about banks leaving the market and there's this huge void, that's not to say that we've completely supplanted the banks. And in almost every transaction we do, we're partnering with a, a bank institution. And if we're not, people should bear in mind the large banks, the systemically important banks, are actually the largest liquidity providers into the middle market, but they're doing it as rediscount lenders or structured credit providers that come with much higher ROEs, much better regulatory capital treatment. And so they're accessing the asset class in a different way in partnership with folks like us. So I think but, that's a really important But one of the point. things that we really believe is occurring over the next several years and has started is that these banks, especially on the origination side, um, are adding kind of layers of transaction costs and fees, but then distributing down to the regional players. Mm -hmm. And there's just a natural disintermediation that is bound to happen. When you have tight yield environment, you have smart investors who are originating the loans on these great platforms, it's only so long that that extra point or two comes in when people aren't putting their balance sheet up for risk. And it actually serves as one of the bigger impediments, I think, in the market uh, because you have a disintermediation between the decision makers on who's actually going to buy the or provide the financing and the structuring party who's uh, got kind of other incentives. Yeah. I think that, that goes hand in hand with what Andre was talking about with ADT, where at the higher end of the, the high end of the middle market now, People are going direct to private investors as opposed to going right. through what used right. to be the syndicated loan market. That's another big, big disintermediation trend is these pools of capital are scaling. That's right. Yeah. I, I, I would agree uh, with what uh, Steve and Mike are saying. I mean, we definitely uh, have several situations where we work very closely together, especially with regional banks, um, where you know we would do a, you know they would do a first out. Then we'll do a last out or you know senior mess. So that happens all the time. We uh, view them as partners, not as competition. And then the second thing I would also say is that there's certain things that we will not, you know, we'll never do, which is you know cash management and you know taking deposits, etc. So there are situations. There could be situations where you know there's a company that uh, you know that uh, the the cash management and deposit business would be very valuable uh, for a bank, and we're happy for that uh, you know company to take you know give that business to the bank, and the bank is also providing senior lending, and you know and we'll provide uh, you know the junior lending there. So uh, you know uh, and, and and I think that's uh, an area where you know there's really no competition at all. Mm -hmm. And let me ask about your uh, fundraising and your investors. Are you finding that the investors that are coming into the space now, <coughs> are they natural investors for the space, or are they just fleeing a, a broadly syndicated market and low returns? And then if interest rates start going up, obviously, are they going to kind of flee out of this space again? I'll make a comment, and then Andre's, Andre's going to probably tell me I'm completely uh, <laughs> off base. But um, I think the structure of the market for institutional investing in this asset class has fundamentally changed post the financial crisis. Um, if you look at a classic pension fund, endowment, uh, sovereign investor even, it used to be fairly simplistic. Fixed income, global equities, and then something called alternatives. And alternatives, depending on the institution, usually meant that's where I make 20% or that's where I make private equity and hedge fund investments. Um, and in a lot of those places, those three groups were not really collaborating and communicating. Not true for all, but true, true for many. And so for years, when we would be talking to these organizations about private credit, there was nobody to talk to because when you talk to the traditional fixed income person, too racy, illiquid, you know, don't know how to evaluate it. And then when you talk to the alternatives person, 8% was something that they would kind of, you know, thumb their nose at. What's happened now, again, back to some of my earlier comments about the 
global growth environment and the interest rate environment is if you have an actuarial payout requirement of 8% and now there's an asset class that is on your, your strategic map or your allocation model that says that you can earn an 8% cash on cash return with short duration, low correlation to other asset classes, that's something you start to pay attention to. And what we've seen over the last five or six years is that groups have formed now within the institutional investors in a way that didn't exist before. They're either JVs between traditional fixed income and alternatives or alternative credit groups. And I think they're now much more equipped to, to have that conversation. And I'll hand it over to Andre. I, I took note when he said that he came to PSP and private debt wasn't actually in, in the stable and, and now it is. So I, I think that's something to keep an eye on. Yeah, no, I, <clears throat> I think private debt is the infrastructure of this cycle. Like, it, you know, 15 years ago, pension plan were not really invested. And then as interest, was, interest rates were getting lower, they were trying to find an alternative to bonds. And now, you know, they're massively involved in the asset class, so much so that I think that, you know, the pricing is, is a bit crazy. And, and, and more importantly, I think that the, the risk is, is misanalyzed in, in a lot of the infrastructure play. So I think that, uh, you know, again, pension funds are looking for alternative. Uh, in Canada, the risk-free rate is zero, essentially, right now. Uh, our mandate is to deliver 4.1 plus inflation to the government. We need to find the asset classes that will deliver that on a good risk-adjusted return basis. And, and I, I think that we're not the only ones seeing private debt as, as a class that can deliver that, at least in part. Anything to add, Brian? Or no, I think I think uh, I think that's right. I think uh, really with the with the advent of the sovereign wealth funds coming into the market, both the private equity returns that are required have, have lowered from that 25 percent level to the 15 percent level, and the same thing has happened with the with the rest of the market and the private credit market, where the return, you know, thresholds in that you know eight to 10 percent is is considered very good, and so um, so there's a great great opportunity here for. Um, for investment and um, continuing this trend for quite quite some time, even with the, if interest rates rise. And you know the thing about the thing about our market is that we we lend on a floating rate basis. So if interest rates go up, we actually do a lot better. So it's it's uh, even though the economy is worse, we do a lot better. And and so we're we're kind of counter cyclical, even though we're non correlated and um, and have lo very low volatility relative to the other asset classes. Okay. Uh, I, I agree with everything. And I would just add that, you know, given where global growth is right now, I mean, it just seems that uh, interest rates rising anytime soon seems, uh, yeah. you know, premature. Yeah. Um, okay, so let, let's talk a little bit more, though, about the, the market structure. So uh, the mid-market has a reputation, for sure, of having better structural protections for investors. Uh, but capital flows are dramatically exceeding the uh, overall market opportunity set in this, uh, in this market. So I guess, how, is your, how are you feeling about your negotiating position, gentlemen? <laughs> Any Sponsors or middle market CEOs <laughs> in the room? Um, I, it's an interesting, I don't see the world that way and it could just be a function of, of the, the seat that we're sitting in or the deals that we're seeing. I, like I just said, I don't see that flows are outpacing uh, the available opportunity. Um, so it's hard, hard to talk about negotiating. The one thing I will say, as the market evolves and borrowers become more facile and sophisticated with these instruments, by definition, you give up a little bit of, of negotiating leverage, but that's appropriate as, as the market matures. Um, but we're not experiencing that capital is outpacing the investable market opportunity right now. And I think, I think uh, you know, the main, the main point here is in, our, in the middle market and the lower middle market, there is um, strong covenants in there and there's, there's, um, there is no covenant light deals in this market. And so, not unlike the high yield market, so you know there is protection here. There's covenants. If someone breaks a covenant, they got to come in and talk to you, and um, and they have to fix what's going on. Okay. I just add, and I think it comes back to what Mike was talking about earlier about taking a step back and looking at it. Uh, we started with the analogy to the banks and seeing the dramatic pullback 
none of the capital flowing into the private middle market lenders is offsetting the amount of capital that had come from the bigger banks. But that story is not a story just of the past from the Great Recession, it's a story today. Because just here in LA, we've had the two largest uh, regional players who are pretty active in the market uh, go through acquisitions that cause them to go over that $50 billion threshold and become one of the systemic, systematically important banks. And what you're seeing in real time is a significant pullback in middle market lending, especially sponsor finance, and a little bit of a diaspora of a lot of their teams. So it's, it's not just the legacy of what happened, but it's as banks continue to grow and they cross that $50 billion mark, they're bringing themselves out of the market. That provides opportunities for smaller guys like us, which uh, would have a hard time competing with a really strong SIFI. And it also provides continuing opportunity where it's not just the private capital coming in that need, that is growing, but you have to look at it in terms of all that capital, billions of dollars that are coming out from these banks that are transitioning away uh, even yeah. today. All right. Yeah, you know, the one thing I don't agree with Michael is I, I, I agree with him that today we don't see it. But, you know, if you look at every single asset classes in private investment, the, the, the trend is when capital saw it as an opportunity, there was more capital and the return came down and private debt is not going to be any different than that. And to me, you know, what I fear is that uh, as everybody sees the opportunities in, in private debt, that this is going to become like the co-investment opportunities in private equity where everybody's going to improvise themselves as, you know, a co-investor will want to deploy capital. They will not have necessarily the team uh, to do it. Uh, and that, you know, because of the pressure of deploying capital, the, the terms are going to soften and, and are going to be less attractive to the lenders. It's interesting, though, just to be clear, um, 20 years ago, when we made a mezzanine investment in a middle market company, we were earning 20% plus rates of return with 12 to 14%, we're smiling now, 12 to 14% rates of return, <laughs> free warrants, and now a regular way mezzanine deal for a larger company is 600 basis points inside of that. So we have seen return come out of the market. I'm not implying that we won't continue to see that happen. That, that's the evolution of a market. I would just go back to something that Stacy asked about earlier, which is what's the value proposition? And fundamentally, these assets are harder to originate. They're more complex to manage. They are capacity constrained strategies in a non-capacity constrained market and they're illiquid, and the market may shrink the illiquidity premium, but I'm pretty confident that that illiqui illiquidity premium will sustain itself. So watching returns come in, if it's a sign of a maturing market, isn't necessarily uh, something to, to fret about because we've already seen five to 600 basis points of return come out of the market as it's, as it's matured. If we have periodic supply demand imbalances, obviously that, that, that works both ways. But. And of course, Andre, you're not doing yourself any favors by talking about the opportunity at the Milken Institute Global <laughs> Conference in front of all, of, these, all of these people. Uh, it's got to stay among us. <laughs> Let's talk about the policy environment more broadly. And Bilal, I'll start with you. Would you say that the policy environment is supportive of middle market capital formation in the U.S.? Yes, I think uh, <clears throat> I would say yes and no. I think uh, if you look at uh, what's been happening with the uh, BDC legislation uh, that's uh, been in front of Congress, uh, uh, you know, you would say probably not that great, you know, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, just the, you know, time uh, it's taking to get that through. But uh, but certainly there are good people in Congress who are trying to help us uh, on that front, and Mike has been at the forefront of that. Uh, I think uh, the one place where uh, legislation has actually worked, um, and our Congress has actually come together and passed uh, legislation in a bipartisan way that is actually uh, is going to, I believe, help the economy and create jobs. Uh, that's on the uh, SBIC front. Uh, they, and the SBIC really, uh, what it stands for is a small business investment company. Um, and uh, the Small Business Investment Company program is the program of the uh, SBA, the Small Business Administration. And uh, this is a really good uh, place, in my opinion, where you have good uh, public-private you know, partnership. And uh, essentially, 
the way this program works is that for every uh, dollar of private capital, uh, the SBA uh, gives you two dollars of long-term fixed rate financing. So it's 10-year fixed rate financing uh, at very attractive uh, levels. So the financing that we have in our uh, BDC uh, through the SBIC program, that's, uh, that, that the interest rate is uh, about 3.2% 10-year fixed rate. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a good uh, uh, attractive uh, financing. Uh, SBICs uh, you know, uh, were set up, uh, this program was set up in 1958, and uh, since then, uh, over 87 billion of financing has uh, been provided by SBICs to about 116,000 uh, businesses. So it's been a very effective program. Through the SBIC program, by the way, Apple received its financing, FedEx, there are some companies that are very large right now that got their start from that program. And uh, as I was mentioning earlier, this is a good uh, example of where uh, our legislators have uh, come together and uh, have done something that's uh, uh, been uh, good, and, 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 and I'll explain why. Um, uh, until last year, uh, the SBIC program could uh, only provide uh, up to $225 million uh, of financing to a family of funds. Uh, that limit uh, in December of last year was increased to 350,000. 350 million. Uh, sorry, 350 million. 350 million. So uh, from 225 to 350 million, uh, and uh, uh, the bill uh, when it passed through the House was passed unanimously. So it's, which is obviously very rare, uh, and and then it eventually got passed. Uh, bipartisanship. Uh, so uh, real around. bipartisanship yeah. and support for small businesses. Yeah. And the only thing it should be bigger because it's uh, yes. It's it's uh, revenue neutral for the United States uh, Treasury and and um, you know any losses are charged back through the uh, system. Uh, there's about 100 basis points charged there, and uh, so it's a um, you know it's, it's as good as good a thing as as there is out there. Yeah. And Mike, let's, can we talk a little bit about the BDC legislation? What, what parts of it, or, or why do you think it's important, and how, how's it going? So, as Bilal said, I think it's going well, uh, as, as many things in Washington. I think sometimes we, who aren't in Washington, can get frustrated with the, the pace of change. But um, I think many of you may, may know it actually passed through the House Financial Services Subcommittee in a resounding bipartisan vote with only four, four dissenters. And so, in today's day and age, given the political climate, to see that kind of bipartisan support for a piece of financial services legislation, I think is a pretty, uh, pretty good indicator that it wants to, to happen. Uh, and when you think about the policy reasons for it to happen, it's everything that we've been talking about here today, which is job creation and capital formation for small companies. Um, so I can't predict if and when it will happen, but at least uh, to date, the <coughs> indications are that it, it wants to get done. Um, I, one interesting thing that may not be on everybody's radar screen, but it's frustrating for folks who are in the lending business, and it talks about some of the peculiarities of the regulation. If you want to make non-real estate loans, and this we could we could talk about the regulatory bias towards real estate loans, but if you want to make non-real estate loans, i.e., cash flow loans, you have three choices: you can be a bank, you can be a BDC, or you can uh, raise a private fund. <laughs> If you want to be a C Corp finance company and invoke the 40 Act, it becomes very difficult to actually be in the middle market lending business. So, one of the things we've tried to talk to legislators and regulators about is a need to rethink existing legislation and, and regulatory framework to allow for this capital to form. But if we really wanted to do something drastic, it would be to take a step back and think about new structures that could be put in place. Because you could either be a BDC and be levered one to one and make a loan, or you can be a bank and be levered ten or fifteen to one and make a loan. But there's nothing, there's nothing in between. Yeah. Um, and so the framework that exists today is just very inflexible uh, in making those loans. So I think the legislation is a good, good step in the right direction because it increases uh, leverage within the BDC sector to be commensurate with the SBIC program, i.e., two to one versus one to one but it probably still stops short of something much more transformational that needs to occur at some point to allow the right structure to be put in place to have companies make loans, because right now it just doesn't exist. 
Okay, I want to end in the six minutes that we have left on a, on a higher level uh, note so that Mike's not irritated with me at the <laughs> end of uh, the panel. And so when we think about mid-market firms, we often think of them as the, the vanguard of the economy, the bellwether of the economy. So I'll ask you all, I'll just go down the line to think about your underlying portfolio companies and what are you thinking about the, the health of the economy and the prospects for 2016 based on your underlying portfolio companies. And I guess the, the more sort of detailed question about that is, do you see a, a wall of, of loss or default coming down uh, the pike later or, or not? Or how do you, what can we read into your portfolio companies? As, well, I, I guess what I'd, what I'd offer is, what we see is structurally the larger, bigger syndicated deals are probably going to be the first to experience credit issues. It seems to be reminiscent of uh, past Wall Street attempts to originate things and not hold anything on their balance sheet like the mortgage market. Um, I, I think they're high quality deals, but I think the larger ones probably uh, will show the stress before more of the portfolio lending approach where you've got kind of the longer term guys really minding the store of what they originate. Okay, Brian? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think that the um, if you look over history, and I've been doing this for 35 years, um, and you look at um, debt to EBITDA ratios in lending, and as they've creeped up, and as you creep up past four and a half times, that's when you have problems when there's a correction in, in the market, because it, it always seems to come back to four and a half times um, in 35 years during the recessionary periods. So, you know, when we hit a recessionary period, the next one, those that are above four and a half times are going to have problems. And, um, and you'll have a retrenchment, and it actually will be better business because uh, for the ones that remain that have been disciplined, because the pricing will be there for you. Hello. Yes, uh, I, you know, I, I think uh, obviously the, this current economic in expansion has been going on for more than seven years now, and we're obviously uh, certainly, you know, beyond the halfway point here, <coughs> and and you've already seen some stress in certain sectors, you know, energy and uh, metals and mining, and commodity sectors. So, we're just, uh, you know, uh, we're always cautious, but we're you know being extra cautious and uh, uh, sticking to our underwriting, you know, standards. I think uh, this point was mentioned earlier. I think in the middle market, you you uh, tend to get you know better you know covenants you know better terms and better protection so uh, you know we'll uh, stick to those uh, going forward well i think lots of people put in their downside slash crash case the 08 period and the v shape uh, kind of kind of recession i think where people would get into trouble is that if we have an 08 scenario but a slow prolonged uh, recovery I think that's that's the scenario where I think it's going to hurt the most. Yeah, we're seeing good fundamental performance, but similar to uh, the public markets, I think there is definitely an earnings recession at play in the economy. So while we still have growth, I think the rate of growth is slowing, and that ultimately should lead to an increase in defaults. But when interest rates are zero, it takes a really long time for, for a company to default. So I, I, we can't predict when, but... Uh, at least in my own view, I think it's going to be at least 2018 before we start to see actual defaults tick up. Now, the markets have gotten better at predictive default rates, looking at leverage levels and, and you know potential for shadow defaults. But just given the interest rate environment and the coverage that exists at a lot of companies, you can have some pretty meaningful earnings deterioration before you actually trigger a default today. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for attending the session. Let me thank my panelists.